Hey, yeah, uh, what's going on, runners? This is the Healthy Runner Live show, and this is the Ask Dwayne Anything episode. This is going to be so much fun. I am super excited for this. Um, I am going to get right to your questions that you submitted, and I really broke these down into three main categories or three main buckets. They're going to be the injury questions, the nutrition questions, and then the training questions. So in this episode, we are going to be talking about Achilles tendonitis, Morton's neuroma, knee pain, muscle cramping in the bottom of your foot. Um, collagen supplementation, compression socks, hydration and fueling for a half marathon race. And we're also going to be getting into foam rolling, rotating your running shoes and cross training, tempo runs, yak tracks and mistakes made by novice runners. And honestly, hopefully other questions if time permits and allows us. I asked for questions. I sent out a message via uh, social media first on Instagram and Facebook um, within our Healthy Runner Facebook community. And then I also sent out an email to everyone who is on our email um, list. And you guys, you guys stepped it up. You brought the questions. Um, the thing that I am excited about here is that not only are you going to get my responses, but you're going to also get some of the experts on our Healthy Runner team, um, their responses in weighing in on some of your questions. So thank you all who are jumping on here live. Uh, Sue, Coach Katia, Roger, you can definitely get to your questions, Roger. Um, Katia, good to see you or virtually see you. Um, thank you guys so much for jumping on here live. And I'm, I'm really like excited about this episode for I'm excited about most episodes, but this one was like kind of fun. Uh, just kind of hearing your questions and there's such a variety of topics. So usually most episodes we like hone in on one specific topic, but I'm, I'm excited about a little variety today, a little variety of spice of life. Um, so let's get right to your questions. Honestly, if you're listening to this, most likely you've listened to other episodes. So as you know, I'm Dr. Dwayne Scotty, a physical therapist, running coach, and I'm the founding owner of Spark Healthy Runner, um, our community that helps you get stronger, run faster, and enjoy lifelong injury-free running. And you know, this is um, these are going to be some questions that some are going to be common ones that we've answered many times before, and others are going to be new. So there's a couple like kind of niche specific topics that we really will never ever do a full episode on. So for those topics, I think I'll go a little bit more in depth, but for others that are like quick answers and, you know, I'll direct you to direct you to some other resources that we have within our community, if that's okay with you guys. So if you guys are ready for the questions, let's, um, let's get into the first question. And this one was from uh, Jarrett, who wanted to know, um, he said that he really got a lot, a lot out of the first two episodes about Achilles tendonitis. And, you know, thanks for sharing valuable information at uh, the point where I can run, he's at the point where he can run with pain at or below a level three, and it doesn't get worse as he runs. His pain is in the mid portion. So for those of you who are wondering, it's not right where the Achilles tendon attached. It's about eight inch above that. All right. So it's about an inch above that. And for those of you who are here live, can you just let me know if you can hear me because I had my mic change for some weird reason. So I want to make sure that you guys can hear me still because um, I know we had some audio technical difficulties uh, in last week's episode. So please let me know um, just so I know not to uh, continue on if you cannot hear me, but I think we should be good to go. Um, Thank you. Thank you guys for letting me know. Awesome. All right. So getting back to uh, Jared's question here is we also suggested doing exercises and he's been implementing those. Um, one thing he either missed or wasn't in the second episode, how do you determine running volume? So that's the big question um, that Jared has is how do you determine 
running volume. I was up to 40 miles per week before the Achilles started acting up. Of course, I ramped up too quick and got near 50 miles per week when the problem started. So I think you've identified that your training error is what kind of triggered this. And this is what we talked about in our base training episode. Um, So he wants to know, do you determine this on an individual basis for each person? And might be a tough question to answer generally. I'm not able to listen live because, okay, excellent. Um, And he said, thanks. You're doing great work. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for submitting your question. Um, Yes, absolutely. Running volume is going to be determined on an individual basis because it really matters on how long you were doing 40 miles per week before your Achilles started acting up. So it sounds like you're doing well with implementing the strategies that we talked about in our Achilles episode and that I have in my Achilles PDF. Um, kind of a guide to overcoming Achilles tendonitis um, and getting back to running. And if that is the case and your pain levels are below that three mark that you mentioned, and they're not getting worse during your runs, then you want to think about gradually increasing that running volume by literally no more than 10% each week or even every two weeks, especially depending upon how long your Achilles was hurting for. If your Achilles was just hurting for a week, two, three, or four weeks, then you might be able to go up 10% per week once your symptoms are well controlled, as you kind of describe that they are right now. However, if you've really been battling this for months, then I would definitely do a more conservative return to where you were. And then the return to where you were really depends upon how long were you running 40 miles per week? Was it months or like, did you just get up to 40 miles per week? And really, when we look at your body of work the last couple of months, you know, were you averaging 30 miles per week? If that's the case, then again, it's going to be a more conservative ramp up um, with your total running volume. So hopefully that answers your question. For those that might have Achilles issues and you're not aware or familiar with the previous deep dive episodes, there are some two great episodes I would highly recommend. Episode 60 on why does my Achilles hurt when I run? That's kind of part one. Episode 61 is Achilles tendonitis treatment and prevention. Um, so definitely check those out. And the other um thing, if you want, or if you're wondering, can you actually overcome Achilles tendonitis and still run and not have to stop running? Check out episode 88. Um, Hear Lisa's story. She's one of our winners um, from our Healthy Runner coaching program. She shared a little deep dive story on what she was battling and how she was able to kind of build up and train for her first half marathon, um, even though she did have Achilles tendonitis. So check that episode out. Um, we also, if you check out those Achilles episodes, you'll most likely be directed to our ebook that we have on overcoming Achilles tendinopathy that I mentioned. So great question. Let's get to the next one here. Tyler asked, um, I have a new recent onset of muscle cramping, or I have a recent onset of muscle cramping in the bottom ish part of my right foot when it happens always a few miles into a run, it radiates into my hamstrings. It never happened like this, or it never happened until like 12 of my first, um, so mile 12 of my first marathon when it hit me out of nowhere. So now it's happening every single run and he's not sure what is happening here. Um, so Tyler, thank you so much for your question. I remember, um, you posting about this in our community when this happened during your race. So Tyler, congrats to you first off for crushing your first marathon. And I know you got some big goals, um, in the future and this pain really started during the race itself. And now you're all feeling it on every run and it's radiating up into your hamstrings. So just to be clear, the hamstrings are going to be the upper part of your leg and not the calf region or the lower part. So I'm taking it as that from what you described, because that's where your hamstrings are located. I know sometimes folks get kind of the calf muscle and the hamstring kind of confused. So your question uh, really concerns me for two main reasons. And the first of which is that the pain is radiating up into the hamstrings from the bottom of your foot. 
Um, that is not a common pain presentation. That is not consistent with kind of cramping of your foot muscles. That is not consistent with plantar fasciitis or Achilles tendon pain, right? Like radiating up um, concerns me. And then it also concerns me that this has worsened as it is happening more frequently for you during every run now. So now this is kind of information, and this is important for those of you who have similar kind of injuries that you're battling. If your pain is not getting better, and in fact is actually getting worse by occurring more frequently, and you used to feel it during only your long runs, or you used to feel it only when you ran fast. Now you're feeling your pain during every run, not a good sign, right? So something needs to happen. Um, you need to change what you're doing, essentially. Um, However, for you, Tyler, honestly, what I would recommend is for you to actually get evaluated by a local provider. Um, I would recommend you see a running PT um, in your area, but you might also you know, have a good rapport relationship with a good running chiropractor, sports doctor, or orthopedic. Um, only a good history and a physical exam will actually properly diagnose um, what you've described here and determine if this in fact is coming from elsewhere and not actually a problem with your foot or even a problem with your hamstring. But based upon the limited information I know right now, this could easily be coming from your lumbar spine, um, such as a pinched nerve that is irritating the S1 nerve root, which can refer pain down to the bottom of the foot. And this has been described by clients that I've worked with in the past, um, that they kind of describe it as this cramping feeling. So this could be some nerve irritation that you're actually feeling um, as opposed to a foot specific problem or even just muscle cramping. So my advice to you, Tyler, is let's get you hooked up with a good local provider, have them take you through a thorough evaluation so you can get properly diagnosed. And that is going to really dictate next steps. Because if we don't have a proper diagnosis, then we really can't go forward with what is the best treatment. Um, treatment's going to look dramatically different if it's coming from your lumbar spine, you have a pinched nerve versus if it's actually like a muscle cramping issue um, that you're having. So hopefully that makes sense for you. Um, and let's get to the next question here. So Chris um, asks, so Chris, thank you so much uh, for your question. Chris is one of our um, coaching clients in our community. And he had a good question on how do you treat Morton's neuroma? So never really talked about Morton's neuroma on the podcast before. So let me just kind of fill you guys in on what actually is Morton's neuroma, just in case you've ever felt this yourself and you were wondering what the heck is this pain on the bottom of the ball of my foot? Um, this pain is usually between like your third and your fifth toes. And it may feel as if you're standing on like a pebble in your shoe or like your sock is folded. And then you like go and look at your sock and it's like, Hey, there's no crease there. Um, or, Hey, there's nothing stuck in the bottom of my shoe. you like, turn your shoe over, you shake it out. Um, I've definitely done that before, but there's usually pebble. Um, All right. So I am uh, just making sure that you guys can still hear me because Zoom is playing games with me and is trying to keep transferring my microphone to uh, my AirPods that aren't even on or connected. So this is uh, pretty interesting. So can you guys hear me now? Okay. Now I can hear you. All right. There we go. Whew. Oh, man. I'm sorry, guys, if this happens. Um, throughout literally, I don't even, my AirPods are literally in my case. They're not even opened or anything like that. So let's hope, uh, zoom cooperates with me. Um, so getting back to Morton's neuroma and, you know, this really involves thickening of the tissues that are surrounding the nerves in the bottom of your foot that lead to your toes. And this can be described. Usually most people will have this. It's more of a sharp burning pain in the ball of your foot. So like some people will say it's stinging, burning, numbness. 
those are all classic tell, telltale signs that this is more of a Morton's neuroma as opposed to either metatarsalgia, which is basically pain underneath the ball of your foot or the metatarsals or a stress fracture. So stress fractures of the metatarsals can occur. So that's definitely in the differential diagnosis. Um, those that have a tendency, maybe you're a runner who wears a lot of heels, um, heel shoes um, during your job, during the day, and a lot of pressure goes to the front of your toes, like to the front of those metatarsal areas, as well as where these nerves are. Um, you may be more at risk for developing this and even just switching to lower heeled shoes, um, might be a good solution for you as well as a wider toe box. Um, so getting to kind of treatment and Chris, your original question there is for you, I would imagine you're not wearing high heeled shoes. Um, so kind of, you know, you got that covered and then wider toe box. So that would be definitely a solution. Allow those toes to splay out a little bit more. So I have a couple pair of ultras that I'm not running in, but I am wearing for kind of kicking around as well as doing my strength training in. And I love that because I have a wide forefoot, right? And I have this little bunionette deformity where it's like a bunion, but it's on your fifth toe. And so my fifth toe sticks out to the side. So I have very wide forefoot. And those ultra shoes are very nice because they have a nice wide accommodating um, four foot area. So that might be something that would be helpful. Um, other things that are going to be helpful is arch supports possibly, um, or foot pads, what we call kind of metatarsal pads or metatarsal mounds. So that's what I actually have as well, because my fourth metatarsal head is dropped or what we call plantar flexed. And I use a metatarsal mound in all of my inserts to allow the pressure not to go directly to that metatarsal head that's already dropped down to the ground. Um, so those can help splay those metatarsals out, alleviating some of the pressure around the bundle of nerves. Um, you know, sometimes it doesn't matter with placement though. I will say with these metatarsal mounds or metatarsal um, pads. So I would recommend you probably have someone know um, you know, what they're doing to place it for you because the placement is going to be very specific and to allow for the pressure to kind of be alleviated. So whether it is a PT, a pedorthist, who is a person who specializes in shoe fittings, um, whether it's someone who does orthotic fittings. So, you know, a podiatrist, like all of those people would be able to do that for you. Um, and that could be extremely beneficial. That's what I found the most success with. If this is not getting better, then the treatment is basically injection and you can inject with corticosteroids to decrease the inflammation and break up some of that scar tissue and thickening around the nerve. Um, I can't imagine that feels very good um, in that area, to tell you the truth. Um, I've had a couple of people who have said they've had that done. Um, in the rare case is like decompression surgery, but I've never actually encountered anyone who has gotten that surgery. I don't think you need to definitely um, do that by any means. So hopefully some of that treatment is helpful for you, but you know the most likely cause of pain in this area especially if you're a female, um, is actually going to be stress reactions or stress fractures to the metatarsal heads. So you definitely want to make sure if you're having this continued pain, and it's not more the nerve pain that I described, it's more of sharp pain localized to a specific area, then that's when you, know, you do want to actually see your physician and get some imaging done. An x-ray is going to be able to pick up on any old stress fractures that have started to heal, but the gold standard um, is really the MRI to be able to pick up on a current stress fracture. The other imaging that can be helpful is an ultrasound that really can detect kind of real soft tissue or real time images of your internal structures. And, you know, to kind of help rule in this Morton's neuroma, this can be something that is helpful in terms of like a diagnostic tool. Um, so making sure the diagnosis is correct is first and foremost. And then I kind of outlined some strategies for you, Chris, um, in terms of treatment. It's really a matter of alleviating the pressure to that part of the foot. And usually how we do that is with inserts. Um, how we also do that is with metatarsal mounds or metatarsal pads. All right. 
So now let's get to the next question here. Lisa asked if um, I am in the middle of recovery from surgery that was not running related, how do I progress and get back to running? Um, will I have lost a lot of my running or my fitness from last summer when I was running half marathons? Um, so you're in the middle of recovery from a surgery that was not running related. So let's say some medical type of surgery you may have had, um, whether it is like internal abdominal surgery, OBGYN surgery, um, very common, right? Um, uh, many runners have had this, um, happen to them before. So I think this is a good question to talk about. You're really asking about progression when getting back to running. Um, and will you have lost your running fitness? Um, so the answer to your question is yes, you would have definitely lost your running fitness from last summer, right? Because it's been a while. So if someone has a minor procedure and it's only been two or three weeks that they haven't been injured and it's only been two or three weeks that they haven't been running, the big thing that you do lose is really the ability for your body to adapt to the demands of running. So you will need to start off slow. And actually, Coach Whitney uh, is giving some recommendations here to start off slow and take your time building back the miles. Um, just because you were able to run three miles prior to your surgery doesn't mean that you should start off with three miles now. Um, Coach Whitney recommends trying some run-walk intervals for a little bit and you know building back up to running. And it will take, you know, time and might be frustrating, but rushing back in before your body is ready could cause an injury. So Coach Whitney is exactly right. Um, and that's why I love having her on our team. And this is something we do in our coaching program, right? So we work with runners who are coming back from um, surgeries. I specialize specifically myself in those that are kind of currently dealing with an injury. And I often program walk-run intervals. So whether or not those start with literally 30-second runs, one-minute runs, possibly two-minute walks. And we kind of manipulate the intervals each week to get you running more than you're walking. Um, but you can also start out, um, Lisa, with something simple of just going out there and seeing how you feel and just jogging at an easy, comfortable pace, going at your five out of 10 effort level. And then when it starts getting harder than that, start walking for a little bit until you feel like you're recovered and then you know start jogging again. So you can do informal or you can do a formalized kind of progressive plan that kind of I outlined for my clients where, you know, I can kind of see from a structured standpoint that we are increasing the ratio in a progressive fashion between how much time you're running, how much time you're walking. And yeah, all of those are great tips um, from Coach Whitney there. And yeah, just be patient with the process. And Lisa, you are essentially back in base building mode. So going back to kind of my base training episode that we kicked off 2022 with, um, check that episode out back in January. That will be super helpful for you because that's where you will be in once you start this return to run progression. So now let's go to uh, journey with Joe underscore from Instagram. Ask this question uh, from our IG post is, when is it okay to start running again when recovering from knee pain? So, all right. So we're looking for when can you actually start running again and um, when recovering from knee pain? So I just started running on January 1st, following the Run With Hal app to prepare for a half marathon on March 19th. On February 8th is when I started getting kneecap pain and this was hurting when standing up, up and down stairs, etc. Since then, I would say my pain is at a three or a four. I 100% overtrained as I was following the number of recommended miles, but had no clue what base recovery tempo meant. So I was running the same fast pace every time. Now, from getting injured and having the pain, I took the time to research and realized I did this all wrong. Um, so first off, um, Joe, you are not alone. Um, this is actually very common. So thank you for asking this question because um, this is something that is very common. And, and honestly, congrats to you for starting the new year, new year off right and starting to run. And you know, running is 
um, an amazing activity. And unfortunately, you know, you did make some common mistakes that most of us do when we start running and really essentially doing too much for your body that is not ready to tolerate those demands. And running takes time for our bodies to adapt to the demands um, and get strong enough in order to actually run without developing what sounds like, you know, runner's knee um, based upon your description. And actually, you know, we actually did have a conversation today. Um, so Joe did sign up for one of my strategy calls. So, you know, you did give me some other um, information. And yes, I would say this is, you know, runner's knee. And, you know, this is, this is very common. And, you know, what I, I do like to recommend to most individuals who are starting out, let's say you did start out, you know, the first of the year in 2022, just like Joe, I would probably, um, I, I do like to recommend a good three month solid base training phase prior to, signing up for your first half marathon. Um, and now Joe knows that, and she's going to go back and listen to the base training episode. And uh, just because unfortunately these overuse injuries do occur and, you know, it really takes time for you to develop, um, the foundation for you to tolerate the demands of running. So, Getting into some specific strategies for those of you who are just like Joe out there and you're you're feeling about a three out of 10 pain, um, as long as that pain is not worse than that and it doesn't get worse with each passing day. And, you know, in terms of getting back into running with this type of injury, you can actually not have to stop running. So I know you've been told by your doctor and most people have is like, Hey, stop running, wait for the pain to go away, then start again. I am not a believer of that. And I've helped clients for a decade now without having to have them stop running. So you can honestly reduce your mileage by 50% of what you're doing right now, and then actually get into the, um, strategies that I outlined in our latest episode, episode 111 on the podcast and in the ultimate guide to overcoming runner's knee, which any of you can download for free at programs.sparkyourtraining.com. And if you want to streamline this process, you know, this is where a good running coach and a good running PT can come in quite handy. So I know this is the most common <laughs> running related, uh, really injury that runners suffer, especially novice runners. Um, so, you know, check out, you know, that guide, it can be a great resource for you, but if you do want kind of to fast track your progress as a runner and you're in kind of Joe's similar situation and you want support guidance and accountability that, you know, you can basically prevent yourself from making all the mistakes that myself and our coaching team have made when we started running and be able to kind of fast track your progress as a runner and get you to crush some, you know, half marathons and marathons with confidence, then, you know, that's what we do in our healthy runner coaching program. So for anyone listening to this, honestly, send me a direct email, like email me, Dwayne, D-U-A-N-E, like Dwayne Reed. Um, I know many people do not spell it like that, but that's what my mom did. She spelled it like that. I'm unique. I understand. I recognize, and I've embraced the uniqueness of my name. Um, so Dwayne at sparkyourtraining.com, shoot me an email and I'll be happy to see if you know, you're a good fit for our program. And if you're a good fit for us to even hop on a call and discuss, you know, your current situation. Um, or honestly, if you're listening to this on the podcast in the show notes, you can just click the link in the show notes about our coaching program to learn a little bit more about that. Um, so we also have Coach Kat, who's going to give you a little bit of advice as well, Joe, um, in talk, talking about the mental side of being injured. I know that was another question you had, you know, the mental side of being injured with knee pain and unable to run. Um, so Coach Kat really says to kind of reframe your mindset, to really focus on getting stronger and, you know, take advantage of this lower mileage time to work on areas that you may not normally, you know, do or focus on such as the core. Um, 
Also, very rarely do you have time to stop running completely. So focus on working, you know, strengthening your running muscles. And uh, her personal suggestion is to not look at social media so much as it can make you feel like you're really missing out on something. So realistically, only a tiny percentage of runners out there are posting. So don't let that minority affect you. Love it. Great tips, Coach Cat, um, to kind of not get into the comparison game and you know see the small percentage of runners that are posting their wins on social media, and you're maybe internalizing that and saying like, "Oh my goodness, look at Jackie who just like crushed a ten mile run and she doesn't have knee pain. Why do I have knee pain?" Right. So, kind of reframing your mindset you know, block out the noise, focus on the things that you're not spending time on right now, which is strengthening in order to run and strengthening up that core. Uh, and kind of, you know, think of this as a blessing. And for you specifically, Joe, like you're just starting out in your running journey. So you have many years, right? To be able to kind of perfect this and, and, you know, run for many years. So let's kind of do this right. Focus on the things you need to focus on right now. And then, um, yeah, the rest will be history and you could say bye-bye to uh, runner's knee forever. All right. So uh, D also submitted a question who wanted to know the best ways to prevent running injuries when running. Again, guys, I told you running uh, knee injuries are very common in runners. So um, yeah, the thing I'm going to reference you to is episode 111 on the podcast, uh, D. Also, um, I'm going to actually copy this link, just in case any of our friends who are here on Facebook or watch this on the Facebook replay, by the way, if you're watching the replay on Facebook, let me know, like type in replay. If you catch this after we're live, um, love it. Oh, coach Latoya. What's up? How are you? So good to virtually see you. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. And, um, Lisa says, thank you to coach Whitney and Dwayne. Lisa, you're welcome. And Lindsay, um, certifies and endorses my recommendations 100% um, as Lindsay um, is currently overcoming runner's knee. Um, so she is well on her way to kind of overcoming runner's knee um, with some of the strategies that we outlined. So thank you so much for hopping on, Lindsay. All right, let's get to Jacqueline's question. Jacqueline has a question. She says, I have severe arthritis, bone on bone, diagnosed by x-ray in my left knee. Why do I find running less painful than walking? And is it therefore a good exercise for me? Interesting, right guys? Um, so running is actually less painful than walking, but I thought running is supposed to be bad for your knees. Um, so Jackie also adds in, um, or Jacqueline, sorry, I don't know if you go by Jackie. Jacqueline also adds in, I run about 20 miles a week and I'm age 66 and I'm a female. Um, so kudos to you, Jacqueline. You are crushing your running at age 66. I hope to be you one day when I grow up um, to be running that many miles per week. And um, yeah, there's there's really lots of great exercises for you, um, Jacqueline, in order to kind of, you know, be able to get over, you know, having um, knee pain, even if your knee pain is worse with walking than it is running. Um, this is, this is, I've heard this, uh, I would say I, this is not the majority of folks that have arthritis, um, would say this, but the mechanics are different when you're running and walking. Yes. The ground reaction forces. So the amount of force that actually is transmitted through your knee is greater when you are running because it's three times your body weight because you're in single leg stance. Um, but it might be a function of walking requires more knee extension. So full straightening of your knee to walk. And I'm not sure if you're arthritis with arthritis, it limits our mobility and it limits our motion and we feel stiff. So I'm not sure if that is kind of a trigger for your pain, um, when you walk, um, and why, you know, you have less pain when you run, but I would highly recommend you check out the specific exercises in both the Spark Blueprint um, PDF that I have, as well as that ultimate guide to running without knee pain that was previously mentioned. Um, again, you can get those at programs.sparkyourtraining.com for free um, to kind of get that free download. So I would recommend implementing those hip specific exercises as well as quad strengthening, uh, Jacqueline, for the long term health of your knee to prevent as much, you know, 
progression of that arthritis and really to maintain your functional um, status, right? As you being an active 66 year old female wanting to be able to get out there and run, um, strengthening your knee is going to be super, super important and strengthening the muscle in the hip to decrease the stresses to the knee. Um, we also have done a previous episode um, with a well-known orthopedic um, surgeon on strategies for those that have arthritis. And I apologize for not having that number off the top of my head. It is probably in the episode 40-ish range, I would imagine. Um, but check that out with Dr. P um, talking about kind of running with arthritis. If you haven't checked out that episode yet, Jacqueline, he had some great strategies and it, it's going to be a breath of fresh air for you for him to actually share with you the current evidence and research um, that does state that running is not bad for your knees and you don't need to stop running if you have arthritis. So yeah, hopefully that's helpful for you. All right, we're going to change from the injury topic right now, and we're going to shift into a different bucket um, into some nutrition questions. And actually, we only had one that was submitted here. So Grace um, did submit a question and she wants to know, is it beneficial for runners to supplement with collagen powder? If so, do you have any best practices for finding high quality collagen? Um, so Coach Cat says, I only use amino acid recovery powder after workouts, which seem to help me. Um, I would agree with that um, as I do the same. So I use my essential amino acids um, from my perform essential amino acids from the amino company um, after I did that episode with the good doctor um, in one of our Healthy Runner podcast episodes. And the amino company is actually a sponsor of our podcast. So you can get a, a very nice discount um, for their products being in our Healthy Runner community. Um, you can definitely check out the links. If you check out other podcast episodes, there is a specific link that you do need to click so they know you came from our community. Um, but that's kind of an aside, um, going down the essential amino acids um, rabbit hole. Um, Coach Lou actually um, says in general, if you are not deficient in anything, taking more doesn't actually help. That's why he stopped taking multivitamins as he does a balanced diet. So I agree, Coach Lou, um, in that respect, if there isn't anything that you're deficient in, then, you know, sometimes you don't need them. And probably most, um, you know, we got our, our registered dietitian, Brooke, who weighed in on this question as well, because I wanted to get her input. And this is something that we do with all of our coaching clients in our Healthy Runner coaching program is, you know, nutrition related questions and feedback. We always go to the, the grand master expert, our licensed registered dietitian, Brooke. Um, and then all of us as a coaching team have nutrition knowledge and uh, base and foundation and can kind of follow up with some of her recommendations. But Brooke says the jury is still out um, with regard to the research if collagen truly helps with joint health and gut health. Um, that being said, there are some runners that swear by it and others that don't notice a difference um, whatsoever. So uh, Brooke says, I never noticed a difference with collagen personally. Um, she would recommend, she would say, I, fo I would focus on getting high quality protein sources through the diet before supplementing with collagen. It is not a magic solution by any means. Uh, smiley face, wink, wink. Um, I usually tell people to save their money unless they want to experiment with it. If you are trying to supplement collagen for joint health, look for collagen products that contain type two collagen. There are actually five different types of collagen. So that is definitely good to know. You want to make sure that the supplement that you're getting is actually targeting the correct collagen. So you want to target that type two collagen and then be sure to use collagen that has been tested by third parties for quality. Um, so Brooke also says that she knows that Great Lakes and Vital Proteins are two collagens that have been um, third party tested for quality. Um, so hopefully that's helpful for you, Grace, and thank you so much for submitting your question. So now we are going to switch gears a little bit, but let me just give a shout out to number one, Katya. Thank you so much for uh, dropping that episode 57 on how to keep running with arthritis with Dr. P. Um, and I'm going to butcher his name again, just like I did on the episode. He's got a great Italian 
uh, named Petrilliano, <laughs> and I butchered it again, but I'm just going to call him Dr. P because he said that was okay. Uh, so check out episode 57 if you are battling arthritis. And Alan, hey, good evening uh, from Northern Ireland, he says. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for joining us from Northern Ireland. And now we're going to switch gears into some training questions. So these are going to be, um, yeah, there's a there's a great variety of questions. Here. I just love these. Um, first off is Roger. Roger's in our uh, Healthy Runner coaching program. He's been working closely with Coach Whitney, training for his half marathon, crushing his training. Um, Roger wants to know, what is your opinion on compression socks? Do you recommend them for long runs? If so, what distance or duration would you recommend them? And then also, when would you recommend wearing two pairs of socks instead of one pair? All right. A lot of great questions here. So what is your opinion on compression socks? Love them. Personally, I love them. Why do I love them? Because number one, compression socks has been shown to actually improve your circulation. And that is why they are used for those that have lymphatic drainage issues. So if you have either poor circulation due to your lymphatic system, um, so for those who might have had a history of cancer and they might have had lymph nodes removed, they can get swelling in their extremities. And that's where compression comes in handy. So whether or not someone had breast cancer and they have the unfortunate complication of um, lymphedema in their upper extremity, what the treatment is for that is compression and compression garments and taping. And there's all different treatment strategies and things like that that have been shown to actually benefit. Um, the other thing that it's benefited from is those with um, circulate circulation issues, especially in the veins. So if you don't have great veins, you have some of those varicose veins, spider veins, um, you don't you know, maybe you swell up in the summertime, um, especially on long runs or especially hot, sweaty runs and your feet and your ankles swell. Um, then that's where compression socks can be very useful. Um, so I know myself, I don't have the greatest veins. Like, unfortunately, I, I'm young, right? I consider myself young guys. Come on, I'm like 42. But ever since I was like 30, like the back of my legs and the back of my knee, my veins look like my grandmother's veins look like. So I was always a little self-conscious of that. So um, I know I am going to have some like wicked varicose and spider veins going on if I don't already do. So for me, once I started using compression socks, I, I really got rid of that achy sensation I used to get on long runs. Um, and that's, that's where I see the value is if you're feeling achiness, heaviness, um, you know, some swelling after those long runs, compression socks can be very helpful. It's going to assist essentially what your veins are trying to do and is basically pump the blood back up to your heart to aid in that recirculation. Um, so do I recommend them for long runs? Absolutely. That would be the primary benefit that I see the value in is for your longer runs. However, I like the feeling of compression and I wear them for my speed work. So I'll wear them for my track workouts because I like that feeling of like my calves feeling tight and having that compressive feeling. And then especially over my Achilles as well. Um, I've had some mild, you know, Achilles symptoms in the past. I've had some mild plantar fasciitis symptoms in the past. I like the feeling of compression, whether or not it's just stimulating that part of where I feel pain. It's sending signals to my brain. My brain is sending signals back down to help desensitize the area, which is probably what's happening. It's still making me feel better. Um, so really from an evidence standpoint, I know that there is no evidence that shows it improves performance in runners. Um, however, there is evidence that shows that it does improve circulation in those with circulatory problems. So for me, I kind of take that evidence and it really depends upon your situation. If you don't have any of the problems I described, if you don't have lower leg pain, um, such as posterior tibial tendonitis, or even those with shin splints, I've had, you know, my runners with shin splints wear compression socks and they, they feel like that helps them. Um, so that's kind of the indications. I wouldn't say like every single runner should wear compression socks, but 
that's where I pick my spots and provide those recommendations to the runners I work with. And then your question about how would you, or when would you recommend wearing two pairs of socks instead of one pair? Um, the only time I would ever recommend wearing two pairs of socks instead of one pair is when the temperatures are dropping down into the single digits, because we got to keep those toes warm when we're out there running, um, because all those running shoes are, you know, open um, and allow a lot of air to get through. So that's the only time I recommend two pairs. If you're looking for two pairs to get more compression, I would just find a sock that actually has more pressure and more compressive force. So I have some compression socks that are like super tight, like the ones I actually wore this morning for my little interval run. And I think Roger, you, you saw that post in our uh, coaching community that I went for my first interval run since October, um, which I was super pumped about. And kind of for everyone listening to this right now, I think that's important for you to know, like Dwayne has not run at his interval pace in four months. The reason for that is because training cycles, guys. And that's how we stay healthy. So again, if you are running the same types of runs all year round and not giving your body a break from that and switching your focus in your training, you are doing yourself a disservice from a performance standpoint. And you're really kind of riding that fine line of, you know, getting a running related injury. So in order to prevent that, that's why we got to use training cycles. So again, go back to that base training episode, um, the first episode of 2022 um, that I did, and you will learn a lot more about that. But um, the ones I wore this morning, Roger, I, I digress there, guys. Um, the ones I wore, wore this morning were like my most tightest compression, which I really like. Again, I like how that feels, but I have some that are a little bit looser. Um, I have the calf sleeves as well, and those have various gradients. So you have to look if you do the CEP um, brand, they have different levels. So like level one, two, three, four, five, I believe it goes up to, and you have to check out the pressure gradients. I would recommend trying them on at your local running store, seeing how they feel for you um, to determine how much compression. You shouldn't really need two um, compression socks. Just get the compression socks that have actually more pressure. All right. So that is compression socks. Um, yeah, Courtney, your question about any type of compression socks you recommend. Hey, yeah. I, you know, CEP is a great brand. I have a bunch of those, but I also have another one that I don't even know the brand, tell you the truth. Those are my tightest ones. Um, I've, I've tried others. Um, again, I like more of a tighter fit. Um, so I would, you know, recommend the CEP brand. Um, they are a company that I is on my kind of to-do list to reach out to um, and see if they can actually come on the podcast to provide us a little bit more deeper dive on compression socks. Um, but yeah, that's that's the company right now that I would recommend. Um, whether or not they come on or not, maybe that will entice them. Anyone have like connection with CEP, you can put me in contact to uh, someone in that company. That'd be awesome. So we can get them on the podcast. And then Roger, just because you are just so great and you're crushing your training. You had two questions. I'm going to get to both of them. Um, you really uh, wanted to know about hydration and fueling strategy for your upcoming half marathon. Roger says, I'm planning on using my hydration vest, which has uh, the bladder in the back. We're up to two 500 milliliter bottles in the front pockets. The bladder option feels most comfortable to me, but I'm not sure I want to use a uh, sports drink or electrolyte replacement drink in it since it is more difficult to clean afterwards. Um, do you have any recommendations that work for you or other runners? Great question, Roger. This is definitely a common one and will be something that as um, our runners get really well into half marathon and marathon training season and it gets warmer, this is certainly going to be information that you want to know. So Coach Kat um, can give some advice here. I know she is a big flan, fan of the hydration bladder. Um, and she says, I always put electrolyte solution in my hydration bladder. And I bought cleaning tablets on Amazon and they clean pretty well. You can then run the solution and water to rinse through the hose without taking it out. I would say uh, don't do not leave an electrolyte solution even a little bit in your hydration bladder as it will stink and depending on, on what model it will stain. Also make sure to air dry. You can stick a spatula inside the vest to air dry it upside down. Very good tips there. 
Love it, Coach Cat. Um, the one thing that I will add to that, Coach Cat, um, for Roger is this was something that I actually just learned two weeks ago when I was at my running injuries conference. And there was a great talk. Um, the presenter talked about how um, the type of element that we're running with. So whether it is an armband, whether it is the bladder in the back, um, there's actually some research and shows that your running form and your running gait pattern actually changes with a vest in the back or an armband, or are you carrying a water bottle more so than anything that's attached to you nice and tightly. So I guess the first thing is if you're wearing the hydration bladder, make sure you snug it up as much as possible. So it's not bouncing up and down. Um, I would say based upon that research, and it kind of makes sense to me because I have the front ones where you have those two bottles in the front in my vest and it's pretty secure. And I feel like it doesn't change my running form or my running pattern at all. So from a running form standpoint, I may recommend the ones in the front um, for you, Roger. And personally, I've tried it. I used it. It works. Um, and you know what I also like about it, Roger, is the you have two separate ones. So I usually do for you know when we were doing virtual races or for my long runs, I'll put my electrolyte solution in one, and then I'll put water in the other, um, unless it's like a super humid you know day where I'm going to be like out there in 80 degrees and you know super muggy conditions. Then I might do both of them with the electrolyte solution. But I'll, I'll usually do regular water in one, and then you know it gives you a little bit more flexibility. So from a running uh, form standpoint, but I would you know agree with Coach Cat that in terms of cleaning it, you run into some similar situation. I think the bottles are probably a little easier to clean, to tell you the truth. Um, but you know you still got to watch out with the hose. You got to make sure there's not like water inside the hose. Um, you know you you do put it upside down to make sure it air dries. Um, all those things are super important, um, so you don't get anything growing in there. Um, so hopefully that's helpful for you and many others that are um, listening to this. And then Alan also actually chimes in and says, wash it and store it in the freezer. Interesting. I've never heard that before, Alan, but I would imagine that kind of works if you freeze then nothing can grow in there, right? I would imagine that's the rationale behind that, that it's too cold of a temperature for any like bacteria or whatever to kind of grow in there. So especially if you're storing it in warmer conditions, um, I would definitely say those of you um, who go for your runs um, and you drive to your destination, definitely do not leave it in your car, especially in the summer, because now you're creating those conditions that bacteria can grow. But yeah, Alan, I, I like that. I might actually start doing that, um, throwing it in the freezer after. So thanks for that tip. And Kristen asks, is it possible to foam roll for too long or too often? Should I foam roll on days I don't run? Um, is it possible to overdo it with the foam rolling? Absolutely, if you're too aggressive, Kristen. But can you roll too long? Um, it depends what you're doing after. So I would say you can roll too long if you're going for a run right after or you're doing your strength training. So if you're doing your foam rolling pre-run or pre-strength, which I highly recommend, I do it myself. I recommend it for all of our clients because the rationale is to more stimulate the nervous system actually and to like desensitize your tissues as opposed to recovery trying to relax your muscles. So if it's pre-run, pre-strength, no more than 30 to 60 seconds per muscle group. Um, shouldn't take you more than five minutes to foam roll your top five running muscles. We have a video of that on our YouTube channel. Um, so you can check that out. There's actually a playlist of foam roll exercises. So you'll check out the top five is really all you need to do. Um, and then should you foam roll on days you don't run? I would if you feel like you've had some hard training, your muscles are sore, um, you know you've run your longest run that you've ever run, or you've started implementing speed work, your muscles feel tighter, you just feel stiff, you've been sitting a lot at work, you're doing a lot of walking around, 
right? So all of those conditions are, are times when, you know, I in, instruct our clients to do a little foam rolling on their rest and recovery days, more for recovery, stimulate some blood flow in the area, stimulate some movement. I'm a big fan of foam rolling with active movement. Hence in our calf foam rolling video, you pump the ankle up and down because it makes sense to actually use that muscle, pump it up and down as you're rolling it. Same thing with the quads for the front of the thigh, big fan of bending and straightening the knee as you roll your quads. So you're doing foam rolling with movement. Um, it will feel a lot better for you. You'll feel looser and I believe you will get a better effect. If you want to learn more about how to foam roll, why we're foam rolling, what are the benefits of foam rolling, go way back in the archives to the initial initial like six pack of episodes we released on the podcast, episode five, soft tissue care for runners, which really covered kind of foam rolling and stretching. Um, I'm going to actually drop that link in our Facebook community as well, because I haven't dropped this link in forever. And it's still a good one. I actually clicked on it before. Um, formatting wise, it's not the best work because I was just starting out at that point, right? So things weren't the best. But the information in that blog is like gold, honestly. Um, so if you guys haven't checked it out, check that episode out, check out the blog. There's a lot of written content there, some pictures some video links, things like that, um, some extra resources. All right, let's get to the next question. Amber Lee, how are you? Thank you so much for submitting your question. Um, Amber Lee is one of our winners who worked with uh, Coach Whitney in our half marathon training program. And um, she wants to know how long between races should I take um, a break or rest um, your body. I'm doing a half and then transitioning to full marathon. Chicago, here I come. Um, so that's awesome, Amberly. I'm so excited for you that you're going to be running Chicago. And all right, so how long do we take um, as a rest? And this really goes into our, again, our base training episode. And what I would recommend for you, Amberly, is, you know, if you're building up almost kind of back from, you know, not training for, you know, you're not stretched out, let's say your long runs for your half marathon. Like you're not running eight and nine miles consistently as your base training, then you're going to be ramping up for your half marathon again, right? Like running, you know, your first nine miler, your first 10 miler, maybe a couple 10 milers, then you're going to build up to 11 and 12 and then run your 13.1. If that's the case, then you're going to require a little bit more recovery. Certainly a week of easy running, really ramping the miles down after your half marathon. But those next couple of weeks, you know, is going to be almost like back to the base training phase. And especially for you, Amberly, I believe this is going to be your first marathon. I would highly recommend you really allow your body to fully recover from your half marathon. Um, so the ramp up for your marathon training, and I know you're going to have like great guidance um, from Coach Whitney, um, is going to to really, you're going to be able to get everything out of your runs if you allow that body to reset. So think about, you know, for you, for your first marathon, ideally, you're really looking at a good four weeks of kind of at minimum base training. Could you do a little bit longer? Absolutely. But that base training phase, again, go back to that episode. It's a matter of like, bring your miles down to what you were doing before you peaked in your half marathon training bringing it down to that level, let's say it was 20, 25 miles, maybe 30 miles per week um, for your half marathon training, trying to run those, but all easy miles, easy miles, get those you know miles in per week consistently as a base training before you start ramping up for your marathon training. Um, the other question Amberly had was when rotating shoes, is it recommended to have different models of shoes or can they be the same? And she is asking this um, for injury prevention. Um, so this is um, one thing that I, I've definitely shifted my mindset as I've become more experienced as a run coach, as working with um, way more runners and really, you know, to be quite honest with you, trialing it myself personally, because this is something that I, I used to be a big believer on, like, one shoe because it's going to allow your body to kind of train in that shoe. You're going to use your muscles in that fashion. If that's what you're going to be doing for your race, that's how you should be doing for your training. However, over the years, I've now evolved my thought process after reading, after going to more courses, after hearing from experts, and, and then implementing on my own. And it really started out with COVID, honestly, is when I was 
doing all my strength training, not my gym, but in my living room. And uh, I, I trialed working out barefoot and trying some barefoot um, strength training and really seeing the value that that brought to my training, my stability, working my intrinsic foot muscles, working my ankle stabilizers, challenging my hip stabilizers a little bit more, um, that I saw the value. And now when I went back to the gym, when gyms opened up again, I actually tried different shoes and did more lower profile shoes, did lower heel drop shoes, and then see the value in that in my strength training, and then really started looking at hey, should I be running in different types of shoes? So number one, for those of us who are running half marathons, marathons, I highly recommend you have two different shoes. Number one, that you're cycling throughout your week of training. So you're not always using the same shoe every single day. Apparently, again, I don't think there's evidence for this, but you know, it's going to allow your shoe to recover, just like our bodies need to recover from our runs. The material in the shoes do actually need to recover a little bit and bounce back, um, especially when we're running in hot conditions of summer running in higher temperatures. Um, and then uh, another side note is never leave your running shoes just like your, um, you know, your running vest with your bladders in your hot car. Definitely never leave your running shoes in your hot car um, as well. Um, just because again, that temperature is going to change some of that material and it might wear where it's not providing as much support as it should um, because of those higher temperatures. And who knows, like Alan might tell us to like throw it in the freezer. I don't know. Maybe that's a thing too. We should throw our running shoes in the freezer. Um, so hopefully uh, that answered your question and really getting to rotating your running shoes, definitely. And should they be the same types of shoes? I would say vary your shoes. And this was actually another thing from the conference I went to two weeks ago was supported by many of the running professionals there as well, is that we should be allowing our bodies to adapt to different running shoes to prevent actually the same exact stresses to those areas. So not having the same exact stress to like your second metatarsal to kind of prevent stress fractures, not having the same stress to your peroneal tendons, your posterior tip tendon because you're in the same you know, exact shoes. So varying your heel drop, varying the type of stability um, is a good thing. And training in that is a good thing because again, that's how we're getting our body more stronger, more resilient for running. So hopefully that did answer your question, but such a great question, Amberly. Thank you so much for submitting them and great to hear from you. Um, so Amanda, Amanda wants to know, Amanda's Another one of our uh, coaching clients in our program, um, she says, you recently posted on IG about the benefits of cross training. Does going on a walk count? Um, also, does this type of activity need to be worked into your run plan by your coach or can it just be done as often or as much as you like? And I'm going to defer, I'm going to um, punk this one to Coach Lou because I thought his uh, answer was great to this. Um, he says that cross training is anything that works on the aerobic system um, while lessening or avoiding the impact from running. Um, so, yes, if you're walking and you are working on your aerobic system, so you're walking at a faster pace and you're feeling your heart rate is starting to elevate then um, that can be considered cross training. And Coach Lou says, it is good for you to recover from running and when you're recovering from an injury, but cannot replace due to the specificity. Um, so you'll have to teach the body to run and build the muscle memory for running. And that cannot be done by cross training. So kind of Coach Lou is saying that walking can be beneficial from a cross training standpoint. Um, but when you are, let's say, recovering from an injury and you're not doing run walk, then it's not going to replace the demands of running. Um, so going to specificity of training principles, just like cycling will not replace the demands of running, just like swimming will not replace the demands of running. They are great cross training to work on your aerobic system and can build up your cardiovascular fitness. Absolutely. But if you really want to get faster as a runner, stronger as a runner, be able to run further, then you need to run um, from specificity of training principles. Uh, so hopefully that answered your question there, Amanda. Thank you so much for submitting it. And Rochelle uh, Tornabeni on IG 
ask this question. And by the way, for those of you who are on Instagram and you're not following Spark Your Training, uh, make sure you are following us because we do post, um, you know, Running Tip Tuesdays, Fun Fact Fridays on there. Um, Coach Whitney uh, gives a lot of tips on there, and uh, I'll post some other videos um, of specific exercises that will help you in your running. And I'll post some funny reels um, from time and time again. So make sure you're following us. Um, shoot me a DM, honestly, to reach out. I love connecting with you guys um, who are listening to this podcast. Um, so Rochelle wants to know, why is it so hard to do a tempo run on a treadmill? And I, again, I'm going to punt this one because we got some experts here who have a lot more experience running on a treadmill than I do. I actually did do officially, um, for those of you who are following me on IG, you might've seen this post, but I did officially run one treadmill workout, um, this year in 2022 for the first time in over 10 years. Um, so I did do that, uh, during one of those beginning ice storms that we had, and I literally Really couldn't get my run outside. So I'm going to punt to the experts here. So first, Coach Lou says, uh, tempo is hard anywhere. Um, LOL. Um, but other things to note is that tempo requires a specific pace and treadmill um, can be off in terms of how accurate it is. So if you use a watch to monitor your pace, it can be a random number generator, essentially, even if you calibrate the watch because it is assuming that your form is the same as the calibration run. But obviously, it changes at different paces. So if you use the reading from the treadmill, it's a lot better, but still not strictly accurate. And then Coach Cat, who's our like treadmill extraordinaire on our team. Um, again, she teaches treadmill classes, has been doing it for years, um, has a lot of experience working on the treadmill and helping those um, get their runs in, especially during either the cold months or the really hot months for those down south, um, get their training in on the treadmill without like overheating. Um, Coach Cat says tempo runs are harder because the pace never changes. Um, outside, our body naturally adjusts to the terrain, the weather, um, other conditions. We won't say at a specific number the whole time when we do tempo, or we won't kind of stay at that specific number. If our goal is a 10 minute um, per mile tempo run, then we may run a quarter mile at 9.45, then 10.05, et cetera. So you're always varying, right? Um, during normal terrain outside. On the treadmill, however, it never allows us to compensate or listen to our body cues. So the tre the also the tempo runs based on pace can be tricky in general because we may have um, be having an off day or we may be tired from our training, right? So if you just set it at one pace, it may be too fast for that specific tempo run. So really what Coach Cat is talking about is actually running your tempo on feel. And I know she's a big fan of this on rating of perceived exertion when you're doing any run on the treadmill because of that, right? You're not taking into the variables of when we run outside, there's up and down, there's around, there's other variables going on, um, other muscles you're using. Um, we're going to adjust automatically, our bodies will, and due to how we're feeling, right? So we might run a little faster on a downhill, a little slower on an uphill, and it all kind of averages out to around where your tempo pace should be. On the treadmill, we're like literally setting the pace and it's like, hey, like you got to keep this pace. And that is super hard to try to maintain like the exact same pace um, for a mile, two miles, three miles. Um, so that is why it is harder. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you so much for your submission. All right, let's get to our next question. Um, is are yak tracks worth it for running in the snow? Um, we we have actually three different uh, responses here because I've never run in yak tracks myself personally. Um, Coach Cat says, I personally found they threw my gait off um, and she just found running on good traction trail shoes worked for her. Coach Lou says, in terms of price, I bought it for less than $10 a pair. So it's easy to make it worth it, even if it just prevents one fall. In terms of running in the snow, yak tracks or micro spikes offsets the shoe cushioning and makes you hit the ground harder. So if you have issues on the feet, 
So maybe you might have some metatarsalgias, plantar fasciitis, history of stress fractures. Um, Coach Lou wouldn't recommend it. And then we have our Alaskan runner, uh, Brooke, a registered dietitian who says, for me, they are 100% worth it, but I don't see pavement for six straight months and I run over a lot of ice. As long as I am running in deep snow, I really don't notice the coils on my feet. You may prefer the non-coiled version since they don't feel so bulky. Ice bugs are another option if you are frequently running on ice. Um, they are more pricey, but you can pretty much guarantee traction even on sheer ice. So coming from the Alaskan expert there, um, Brooke. So my take home message, honestly, uh, for this is if you're in an area that it's literally not snow on the ground for the whole time, so you're not in Alaska and maybe you're not in like Minnesota, then um, maybe they might not be worth it. If you have foot problems, I would be careful because now we're losing the cushioning of your running shoes and you're really making your runs a lot harder. Um, and also acknowledge that it is going to change your running gait pattern. It's going to probably change your pace as well. So if it's literally to get out there and enjoy that mental clearing run, be outside, even if there's snow or ice on the ground and you're okay with having a slower pace, you're okay with it throwing, you know, realizing your running gait patterns going to be a little different. They're going to feel different. Um, then go for it. Um, Brooke says, you know, if you have deep snow, like they're going to, be great for you um, to be able to get those runs in. All right. So let's get to our next question here. Courtney, um, she submitted a question through email. So if you are not on our email um, list yet, every week I send at least one email out, just value on our latest training, our latest YouTube video, um, and other information when we release new uh, programs new products when our Healthy Runner store is going to be opening, which will be opening within the next couple of months. So you can get some Healthy Runner swag, um, such as I am wearing right now. Um, you can get some Healthy Runner swag, swag and rock it. Uh, make sure you're on our email list. So yeah, definitely go to you know sparkyourtraining.com, sign up for our email list, or go to programs.sparkyourtraining.com. You know, grab one of our free eBooks, and then you'll automatically be added to our email list. Um, or just shoot me an email. Like I told you before, Dwayne at Spark Your Training. Remember, D-U-A-N-E. Um, and I'd love to hear from you personally, honestly, individually. And then uh, just tell me, be like, hey, Dwayne, like, I don't know. Tell me tell me what you're working on in your running. And then uh, tell me where you're from and be like, hey, add me to your email list. And I'll go ahead and do that uh, manually. Um, so Courtney says, uh, or asks the question of what is the most common mistake made by novice runners that you find yourself having to coach them through? All right. So yeah, I can definitely weigh in on this, but again, we have our coaching team who had some comments that they wanted to add. So I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, read their comments. So coach cat says two extremes, either they think they can't run at all so that you're too old, too overweight, too out of shape. Um, totally agree with this coach cat, or they think they should be running longer, faster because their friend or the internet says so <laughs> and not setting realistic goals for their level at the time. So if you've only run one 5k, you probably won't be able to run a marathon in nine months. Completely agree. Coach cat, 1000% coach Lou adds running easy runs too fast. Um, completely agree. That's the most common issue that I see um, in runners. And then that they can't run hard runs hard enough. And then the comparison, you know, Coach Lou talks about and comparing your distance, your pace, et cetera. And these two are related. Um, beginners um, thought that they're slow compared to more experienced runners, but it's all about yourself, Coach Lou says. And really, you know, thinking about how are you running and comparing yourself to, to yourself, right? And how you started out when you were running, were you running a 12 minute mile, 13, 14, 15 minute mile? And three months later, are you able to actually run at the same effort level, but now you're running faster and you're running a 11 minute mile, a 10 minute mile, right? As opposed to comparing yourself to, you know, myself, which is like a 10 minute mile, you know, easy pace which for Coach Lou, his easy pace, I believe, is like an eight-minute mile, right? So I'm not going to compare myself to Coach Lou. 
Um, I'm going to compare my easy pace to what my easy pace was last year, right? So completely agree there. And then Coach Whitney also adds that not listening to their coach or their own bodies. Many people run their easy runs harder than they should. They don't listen to their coaches or their bodies when it comes to slowing down. Um, easy running makes hard running easier. Yes. Oh, I love that quote. Coach Whitney, um, you are definitely going to have to create a graphic for that one. Um, that is going to be a graphic um, that we're going to create. Easy running makes hard running easier. Whew. Love it. And then I'm going to add to that. If you're just starting out as a novice, you shouldn't be running hard to begin with until you've established your base. Man, we keep going back to base training today, but it's so important. It's so foundational. I cannot stress that enough. If you haven't checked out that episode, um, that's what you need to do. And Courtney, yes, thank you. You're here on the live. Thank you so much for submitting your question. Um, and Courtney also says that uh, the thief of joy and the threat of training is comparison. And um, so she heard it. She said, this is good feedback. So thank you for tuning in to the live. And thank you so much for um, submitting your question. I'm glad that we got to it while you were here on the live. And then um, you also wanted to know about foot strike. So this is a common thing we get a lot. So let's let's unpack this. So Courtney says, it seems there's a lot of debate over best foot strike. Is proper running form truly about foot strike or is another muscle group, either the calves, the quads, the hips, responsible for effective running form? I would guess there's a lot of debate over which muscle group generates the most power and stability. Um, to be quite honest with you, uh, Courtney, there's not a lot of debate which muscles generate the most power and stability. Maybe there's debate on you know, what muscles you should focus on as a runner, depending upon your specific weaknesses. And that's what, you know, I do for my individualized kind of, um, you know, runners that I work with is really identify like the root cause of why people have pain or the root cause of the problem that they're having if they can't get faster. And I really, you know, pick up on based upon looking at running gait analysis and movement assessment, the specific areas of weakness that you need to be focusing on and identifying that problem. But we do know like what muscles function when we run. Um, they're all outlined in my Spark Blueprint. Um, that's where I kind of talk about all the running specific muscles. You have six of them. Um, so go check out the Blueprint if you want to learn more about that. I won't take the time right now to educate everyone about those. Um, and then, yes, there are muscles that generate power. And then there's other ones that provide us stability. So again, that's not, that's pretty much known on like, which are your stabilizer muscles? And then that's how we want to train them differently. So your glute max exercises should be more for power, um, as opposed to stability, your, you know, your ankle stabilizers, your peroneal muscles, your posterior tib, you should train those more for stability. And that goes into your prescription and what you're actually doing in terms of number of reps. Um, what is your hold times? what is your sets, right? So all of that goes into your exercise prescription, whether or not you're working power or stability. Um, and then really going back to the original part of your question was um, foot strike pattern. And there are three different foot strike patterns. There's toe striking, you know, mid foot striking or heel striking. Um, the literature out there shows that there are no differences in injuries based upon your strike pattern. However, there are more common injuries. Let me rephrase that. There are more common foot strike patterns for specific injuries. For example, if you have knee pain, so you have runner's knee or IT band pain, we do know that heel strikers um, will have a tendency to have that type of pain. So if you are a runner with knee pain and you heel strike, it would make sense to think about changing your running form to being more of a midfoot striker. However, recognize that now we're just shifting forces from the knee area and placing them more toward the foot and then vice versa. If you have a foot problem, plantar fasciitis, metatarsalgia, we talked about before, you may consider shifting load from the foot to actually transfer it to the knee. The key here is we're making sure we have the foundational strength for the change in loads to these areas. 
So those are some things to consider. There is some thought out there, and this is the conference I went to two weeks ago again. Some of the experts there um, recognize that if they have a big heel striker, that they believe their their thought is that all heel strikers should change to a midfoot striker, that it's going to be healthier for your body um, in the long run. And I tend to agree with that. Um, I, I'm, I'm more on that camp versus not changing what you have. However, you need to train properly with proper progression. Um, so, and you need to be strength training and you need to be in tune to your body to, if you start getting any foot or ankle pain or symptoms, you need to now adjust to that, whether it's you adjust your run plan or you adjust your strength plan. So if you're the type of person who says like, hey, I have this 16-week marathon training program. I do the same program every single year. I train for my fall marathon. And once I'm in training, like that's all I'm doing. I would not recommend you to change your strike pattern if your heel strike pattern has been working for you for years. You don't have issues with knee pain and it's not creating any problems for you. However, if you're really looking to maximize your running economy and your running health for longevity in the future, I would say that most runners would benefit from changing from a heel strike pattern to more of a midfoot if you're willing to be patient, listen to your body, going back to kind of Coach Whitney's recommendation before, and or you work with a run coach, you work with a running PT who can be able to adjust your plan if need be um, as your body's adapting to the demands of that change in your gait pattern. And gait retraining does take time and you do usually need to slow down and you need to actually decrease your mileage to do that. So best time would be after you have your race your recovery period, and now you're just starting out again and you're starting to build back up that base, that would be the best time to try to change that. Definitely not in the middle of training for a race. Um, so hopefully uh, that's helpful for you, but I'll also add in Coach Kat's input. She says from all of her research, if a runner is happy with their running, um, so regarding their distance, their pace, their times, and you know to not mess with it whether you're a heel striker front or mid striker if you're not injured and not hindering um, then don't worry about it. if you have issues pain you really want to change your form up then find a coach who can analyze your running gait and work with them um, this will not be a quick fix um, so it is not ideal to start this during a training cycle better to work on this during the off season so coach cat i didn't even read your uh, uh comments actually yet until i just read them right now and that is just too funny um i think we think uh, very much alike and why i just love working with you because you pretty much just said what I said, and I didn't actually read what you had there. So look at that. Uh, we're on the same page. And Coach Lou says, no, even uh, the elite runners use various strike foot strikes. Um, the more important thing is um, to not overstride. Ooh, great point, Coach Lou. Um, absolutely. Overstriding is the single worst thing that you could be doing as a runner. Uh, not even so much the heel versus the forefoot versus the toe, right? Forefoot or the midfoot um, is overstriding. So you definitely want to correct overstriding, whether or not that um, you know changes your foot strike pattern. Then it may shift you to more of a mid strike pattern when you do kind of change some of that overstriding. So now let's get to our next question here. We are just rolling through these. I'm going to try to blast through a couple more because you guys submitted a lot of questions and I, I would love to be able to get to almost all of them. Um, Adam is asking how to keep active with multiple medical conditions. So someone who might have Crohn's disease, hernia, fibromyalgia. Um, so some of these other chronic conditions um, that you could be battling. First off, Adam, you know, kudos to you for overcoming those chronic issues and actually running because many people who have them do not run. So kudos to you. I think it's a testament to your work ethic, your um, motivation, um, and just I love you know what you're doing in your running. So um, that's first off. And then how do you stay active is really, I think, you know, goes to cross training, um, listening to your body, strength training in order to run. Um, so a lot of the principles we talk about routinely on this show 
um, is going to be important. And, but listening to your body, recognizing if you have a little flare up of Crohn's, if you have a flare up of fibrom fibromyalgia, or you're in more pain, then you might need to you know adjust your training and you might need to go to those strategies that you have that make your body feel better. If your joints are really achy and sore, you know, I'm not sure if, you know, many people with fibromyalgia love a warm water pool, right? And just get in a warm water pool and do some movement, right? And you could still do some great hip strengthening exercises that will help your running in a warm water pool. Or if, you know, you're struggling and getting runs in during a flare up, go and do some water jogging right? To kind of work your cardiovascular system without loading your joints or putting too much stress on your muscles. You know, that might be an option for you as well. So hopefully that's some uh, tips there that can be helpful for you. And um, Teresa, our friend Teresa from Louisiana. What's going on, Teresa? I hope you're doing well. Um, it's been a it's been a hot second since we uh, last chatted. Um, so Teresa wants to know: Is there any harm in doing strength training that doesn't involve jumping barefoot? Okay. So is there any the the question here is: Is there any harm in doing strength training barefoot? And then kind of in parentheses, it's you know that doesn't involve jumping. Um, Absolutely no. So I kind of mentioned that before, right? And Teresa, you remember those videos, right? In our strength program uh, where I was barefoot. So obviously if I was doing it, then it probably was okay to do. Um, so no harm whatsoever. Um, and definitely for you, um, again, the harm, the harm, I'm going to put those in air quotes for those listening on the podcast, um, is really for those that have plantar fasciitis or foot pain. If you're going to work out barefoot, um, you may have an increase in symptoms. So uh, as long as it's not painful, and as long as you're not having any of those types of symptoms, if you have foot and ankle pain, or if you're a person who has like posterior tibial tendonitis, and you're a big overpronator, have a flat foot, and when you're not in supportive shoes, your symptoms get worse, then it's going to take time for you to build up into working out barefoot. But yeah, Teresa, I would definitely go for it. Um, it's going to help your knee um, in the long run uh, by strengthening up your foot and ankle muscles, right? The more that we can strengthen those surrounding areas to a joint that kind of has traditionally caused us problems, then um, that's going to offload, take stress off when you're running. So great question. And Joanne wants to know, can you train for a road marathon, but do the bulk of your training on the trails? Do you need to be training on the roads? All right. So can you train for a road marathon, but actually do the bulk of your training on the trails? Okay. So I'm going to punt this one out because I do not run on trails. If you remember from our trail running episode with our experts, uh, Kim and Carolyn, um, Coach Cat actually says, my suggestion as I am training the opposite way is you should get at least one or two runs on the road a week. It is very different running on trails versus pavement, and it engages a whole host of different muscles. Also, pavement is a lot more unforgiving, so your body isn't used to it. You're going to feel those overuse injuries quicker. Also, if you're looking at times, trails are going to be slower. So see how you're, you feel on the road. And she also suggests referencing the podcast with Kim. And um, for reference, I'm spending three months just building up my ankle strength. She's doing two times a week as suggested by Kim. Um, then I will be splitting runs up with road running for the first third, one to three miles, trail, in the middle, four to seven miles, and then finishing on the road, eight to 10 miles until I get used to true trail running. Just an example for distance. This may be an option, the opposite as well. I love that. And I love that uh, recommendation from Kim. So Kim, thank you so much uh, for for you didn't even know you'd be a part of this podcast episode too. So this is like technically the third Healthy Runner podcast episode that you're being featured in. Um, and uh, Kim is, you know, a trail running 
expert guru, run coach, run physio um, in Canada. Canada. So check out the Inspired Souls podcast uh, where her and Carolyn share some great tips on trail running. So check that their uh, podcast out. But yeah, Coach Cat, thank you so much for um, giving us some specific examples of how you can actually transition into it and do it in a gradual manner. Because I agree, it's going to be completely different demands um, than running on trails. So yeah, Joanne, definitely try to get out on the road as much as possible. You know, the biggest thing, we wouldn't want you to see you training for like two months on trails. And then when you're peaking in your training, you go ahead and try like that 20 miler out on the road, because, you know, that is where you are going to definitely open yourself up to getting either shin splints, you know, worst case scenario, a stress reaction in a bone because your body really isn't adapted to running on pavement, especially for a marathon, right? And especially those long runs. Um, that's where it's going to be super helpful to follow some of the tips that Coach Cat shared um, with you. And then uh, Coach Lou also agrees with Coach Cat, and he adds in that it depends upon your goals. Due to the terrain variation, you can only go with effort level on the trail rather than pace. And for workouts that require precise control of paces, you'll need to run on the road or even on track. And again, it's all about specificity, just like the cross training. All right, Whew. guys, I, I really need to wrap this up. I would love to get to a couple of more Oh my goodness. Um, all right. Ready guys? Rapid fire. Here we go. Cause I, I really feel bad because I know these people who submitted this question. So ready. Gene wants to know when should you stretch and not stretch when you're recovered from an injury? When is it okay to stretch? Um, so if you have been going to, let's say another practitioner, a PT, a Cairo, who's telling you to stretch, um, and you've been told in the past, you might've heard on this podcast to not stretch. Um, and whether or not your injury is healed enough to incorporate stretching. I think that's kind of the, the information Gene is looking for. Does it depend upon pain levels? Um, to make a long story short, um, I'll try to do that. Let's see if I could do that. Is It depends upon your injury. For those with tendon issues, chronic tendinopathies, such as proximal hamstring tendinopathy, um, chronic Achilles tendinopathy, um, What's another good example um, in the knee if you're having um, some chronic IT band pain? Um, stretching is not going to be helpful for you. Um, in the long run, when you're fully recovered, not having pain during your runs, your pain levels are literally a one to two out of 10 at worst. Can you stretch the hamstrings um, conservatively? Absolutely. If your pain levels are above that and you're still having symptoms, stretching is not going to help. It's a matter of loading the tissues, loading the tendons. So for those tendon issues, stretching is not going to be your main treatment. For Achilles, posterior tib, hamstring, chronic tendon problems, patellar tendon um, pain, it's going to be a matter of loading with specific strengthening, eccentric strengthening, heavy, slow resistance. We've talked about that on deep dive episodes of those particular injuries. Um, before. The stretching is not going to help the tissues heal. If you have increase in pain and you've tried stretching before, then you need to stop stretching. Honestly, it's not going to help um, with the healing. Movement is good. So if you're doing active movement into like a hamstring stretch and you take it just before tissue tension and you really don't feel a stretch, I'm cool with that. And you want to do movement-based, you know, active stretching, Go for it, as long as it's not increasing your symptoms. And then Dawn wants to know, how quickly do you lose your running fitness? Um, so if you guys have ever suffered an injury and you stopped running, you've been told to stop running, you're wondering how, do, how quickly do you lo lose your running fitness? Coach Cat says, I think it depends upon how well conditioned you are to the extent. If you're training for a marathon and have high weekly mileage, you may notice that you feel like you've lost your ability to run long distances at a higher level after two weeks. Um, but in reality, you can get back to it quicker than someone who is less conditioned. Um, and she also adds, you know, in her experience, and I would agree with that, um, Kat, it really depends upon like, what's your body of work, right? Like what is your base level of fitness? And then, 
you know, where are you now when you stopped running? And then I would also add is how long were you taking off for? So for Don scenario, if you took off three, four or five days, you're not losing your running fitness, right? You're not. Um, but if it turns into weeks, then yes, you are going to. And Coach Lou agrees with Coach Cat um, that it depends upon your level and also depends upon other scenarios. Are you recovering from an injury? Are you recovering from a hard race? Good point. Or is it just a break during normal training due to a non-injury related issue such as family, personal issues, work issues? Um, in general, if you're not injured, taking two to three weeks break after a hard race like a marathon or an ultra is not a problem whatsoever. You're not losing fitness, right? It's actually good that your body's recovering. And then it also depends upon what you do for the break. Are you completely doing nothing like stopping being a couch potato or are you remaining active and doing some lower impact sports, um, cross training, like we mentioned before, are you doing some stability work? Are you doing some core work? Are you doing some foam rolling? So all the things that we talked about in this episode is going to uh, matter in your uh, fitness level. So I thank you all because you hung in there. Hey, those watching the video version, if you guys hung in here this whole time, I don't even know how long we've been going. I know it's super long, but these were some great questions. I just needed to get to them. So I apologize for the long episode in advance, but hopefully you guys found value in this. Um, you learned something. If you did, let me know if you're watching on Facebook, if you're watching on the Spark Your Training YouTube channel, let me know what topic was most interesting that you learned about. We like probably covered, I don't even know, 15 or 20 different topics. Um, thank you guys so much for listening. I love you guys. Honestly, I love each and every one of you. I love these questions. I love these Ask Dwayne episodes because I get to hear from you and this was, this was fun. So thanks again for tuning in. As always, let's stay active, let's stay healthy, and let's just keep on running. Until next time, guys. Bye.